All right, welcome, welcome everybody to today's special training. I'm super excited to have a couple of good friends with us. Uh, we're gonna show you exactly how to do Amazon Japan keyword research, product research, product market fit. So you can know whether or not your product is going to sell in Japan. I'm very excited to have Ritu Java, Nick Katz, Bradley Sutton, and Brendan Young with us today. Welcome, everybody. How's everyone doing? Doing great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doing great. All right. And we have, we have a lot of people entering from the waiting room as well. Um, so for people that are entering, if you can type your name and where you're joining from in the chat, that'd be great. And uh, we had over 230 people that RSVP for this live training today. Um, I'm very excited. And one thing that stood out to me, because in our initial survey of the people registering, out of 230, like, can you guess how many people, like, only how many people are selling in Japan? I mean, it's very few. Any, any wild guesses? Like, out of 230, how many people do you think? I'll are, say are less currently? than 12. You're very close. You're very close. There were only 13 people out of 230. So, in my, I don't think my good over correct. underline right there. We should have, yeah. we should have had. The... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like five percent. And Japan's the number four biggest marketplace in Amazon in the world. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. That's why I wanted to invite on um, Nick and Ritu and Bradley and Brandon for today. So um, before we get started, just wanted to quickly share. Uh, so in today's training, we're going to give you first an over the shoulder look of how to do Amazon Japan keyword research. We're going to use Helium 10 and then Ritu Java will be the cleaner to do that. She's going to go through some numbers. She's also going to do this in a way that you actually don't have to know any Japanese, but there's going to be a little hack that she's going to share. So make sure you pay attention to that. After that, we're going to show you a strategy of how to evaluate your product market fit of your existing product for Amazon Japan. And Nick Katz is going to lead that part of the training. And then after that, Brandon Young is going to pull up a data dive. He's going to pull up a dive for Japan. So even though like Brandon couldn't read like the, the words, we're still going to help you decipher this about the product opportunity. And then Bradley here is going to be um, from the PM10 side. He's going to be weighing in as well. So um, yeah, so that's going to be our agenda for today. And I just wanted to make a quick note. Um, this webinar today was brought to you by the Seven Figure Seller Japan Mastermind. We're actually doing a live in-person event covering Amazon selling in Japan in Tokyo next month, April 4th to the 5th. So um, everybody presenting is actually gonna be here in Tokyo. So I'm very excited about that. So I want to let you guys know that there's an opportunity to learn even more live and um, learning if you can drop the link in the chat if people want to check that out first all right so um i kind of did the, the rough introductions but let me quickly go around the room to introduce everyone um first off we have ritu java award-winning speaker and ceo of ppc ninja he actually, he's actually lived in japan for 17 years previously she's fluent in japanese so welcome ritu um can you share why should people join your part of the training today yeah, so, you know, although I can read and write Japanese, um, I know that a lot of people uh, find it intimidating, and that's definitely a, a barrier. So today I'm going to try, try and demystify the process so that you guys can know how to do it even without knowing any Japanese. So uh, hopefully it's going to be um, uh, some value add uh, and will help you guys think about Japan more positively. So far, like you said, just 13 people are 230 are selling there, and uh, hopefully Hopefully at the end of this training, you guys will be more confident uh, and would want to experiment with uh, what options you have there. Perfect. Thank you. And next we have Nick Katz. He's a seven-figure seller selling on Amazon Japan. He's been living in Japan for over 20 years. Uh, Nick, why should people join your training today? Um, I think that it can be very nuanced when it comes to deciding on if you sell in another marketplace in Asia like Japan. But uh, I think it could be quite easy for people to find out in just a few minutes, a few hours, whether their products will sell or not, uh, even without actually using any data or tools themselves, just by just some basic using some basic knowledge. I'd like to think that what I'm going to go through today is low level, uh, but I fear it actually may be 
higher level because people just don't seem to be doing it. So that's the reason why. Excellent. And then we also have Brandon Young, who's the co-founder of Data Diet, who's an eight-figure Amazon seller and award-winning consultant. And he'll be joining from the perspective as a, as a seller. And also he's going to pull up a diet. So why should people join your part of the training today, Brandon? Oh, I think it's just a, 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 an amazing opportunity to expand globally. If you're already doing your manufacturing in Japan, the supply chain is so much faster and easier than bringing it all the way here to the US. Uh, that means more turns per year in your capital. That means a higher annualized ROI. And it's a massive opportunity. The market there is very strong and growing and only getting stronger. Uh, we had a whole conversation about this with Nick. And I think Japan is uh, is going to be a great place to go. It's just very intimidating because most people don't speak the language, but there are some ways around that. And I, I think that it's uh, it's time everyone starts to take a look at it. For sure. And I think you meant manufacturing in China and then shipping to Japan, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. I don't know if I, what I yeah. said there. It's getting late here. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for joining us. All right. And then also we have Bradley Sutton. He's the Helium 10 Director of Training and Chief Evangelist. And Bradley, you're coming to Tokyo next month. I'm, I'm curious, why are you excited about coming to the Seven Figure Seller Japan Mastermind? I mean, I'm super excited. I just love going to Japan always. I used to live there when I was younger and I've been there maybe, you know, 20, 30 times uh, elsewhere. Um, and, and Amazon Japan, I think is exciting. I was just there a couple of months ago and I went and visited a few agencies and talked to some sellers. And it's really interesting because most of the Japanese sellers, they do not use like software and stuff. So they don't know about tracking keywords. They don't know about reverse ASIN. They don't, they don't know about like, you know, keyword research and things. They just kind of do it on their own. And so like, I think anybody, whether they're based in Japan or whether they're based outside of Japan, like has a really big opportunity because you guys, uh, have access to different tools like Hel Helium 10 and are able to like instantly get better information that even the people selling there for years don't have. And so I think it's going to be uh, exciting to kind of uh, share, you know, with the, the the Amazon Japan opportunity with everybody and see like everybody's eyes kind of open up big and wide when they when they think that even though this marketplace has been there for years and years, like the competition level is a lot lower than probably what you're used to in say Amazon USA or Amazon Germany. 100%. Excellent. All right. So we got a lot to cover today. So without further ado, Ritu, would you like to start off and share your screen? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So I'll share my screen here. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so my part of the presentation is basically about uh, keyword research. Um, and uh, I will be showing you a method that uh, does not require any language skills. Um, so I guess we've already uh, introduced me, but uh, just uh, just to let you know that I was good, I was born in India and I lived in Japan for 17 years. And that's basically when I started my e-commerce journey uh, on Etsy. Um, and then uh, since then, I've kind of moved to the U.S. and now living in Canada. So that's my background. Um, you know, we've uh, helped uh, lots of um, sellers uh, localize their listings and basically create uh, amazing listings in in uh, in, in Japanese. Uh, you, we have a team that uh, does uh, a lot of the translation and stuff. And so, while helping uh, one of the largest aggregators, um, you know, expand hundreds of their listings to Japan, we basically came up with a methodology that uh, we realized that it can be used not only by people who are fluent in Japanese, but also uh, used by people who are not. So, uh, just wanted to share a few of those ideas with you guys today. Now. Um, I have uh, here like seven ways to do keyword research in Japan because we really uh, researched this. You know, we we said, okay, what are, what are the different angles to actually arrive at the best set of keywords that you could go after? So there were different ways to do it, right? You could enter from so many different directions. And um, here up on the screen, I have like seven ways to do research in Japan. Today, we're just going to be covering the first of those seven. Um, and the rest uh, we will be covering in, uh, in depth uh, at the uh, in-person event in Tokyo next month, less than three weeks or yeah, something like that, right? Four, four weeks from now. So um, so this uh, this method, uh, the first one uh, basically uses um, 
the Amazon search bar, uh, which everybody has access to, uh, Helium 10 Cerebro, uh, and then Google Translate. So I'm going to show you the steps for it, and then I'm actually going to demo it, right? So um, here are the steps. Uh, so basically, when you're on the Amazon uh, COJP website, so it's amazon.co.jp, you basically go there, open uh, open the browser and uh, go there. And feel free to follow along if you've got all the, the tools, like if, if you've got Helium 10 uh, set up. Um, the first thing you want to do is basically enter a Japanese zip code. So wherever you are, you probably won't get the right uh, search results if you are just using your own location. So just pick up a Japanese uh, zip code and enter that as your uh, delivery address that will give you all the correct um, kind of search results um, and then you basically type a seed keyword in English you don't even have to use Japanese at all you don't even need to know your seed keyword in Japanese so you just type it out in English and because the um, you know the algorithm has gotten so much better over time it never used to be this way but now the Amazon algorithm is so good that uh, even with English keywords it is able to give you the the results uh, you know very very accurately so definitely um, you know start with uh, English now of course if you have either um, uh, you know, Japanese or Chinese, you can try those as well as a starting point, and those will also give you the same kind of results. But I'm uh, just doing it for people who don't know Japanese. So yeah. then, uh, no, Michu, can, can I quickly yeah. add? Um, I don't yeah. really know Japanese either. And when I search on Amazon Japan, there's actually a language toggle, so you can switch from Japanese to English, and then that way all yes. of the the results are like machine translated into English. It's not a hundred percent perfect, but you know, for the purpose of yeah. everybody watching today, if you don't know Japanese, you can go to amazon.co.jp, switch on English, so you can um, understand the results. So, um, great stuff. Right, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this is the uh, the drop down the language selector right here, uh, as uh, Gary was mentioning. So you can pick English, and that would be um, just your starting point. You don't even need to uh, switch to Japanese. Um, so, okay, so then uh, quickly the steps, uh, you know, you want to enable the Helium 10 extension, the Chrome extension, and um, find uh, one of the products with the highest search, re highest reviews, and then uh, something that is ranked pretty high on the search results page organically. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how to click on the, you know, open with Cerebro tab, which basically gives you access to the the entire kind of reverse ASIN that Bradley was mentioning, and you get all the keywords for that ASIN. So you want to start with the leader. So that's why you want to make sure that you pick one that has substantial number of reviews and has been around for a while and therefore is ranked higher. Um, and then once you've got your Cerebro, you want to download your Cerebro results and then upload them to Google Sheets. And this is a step because uh, you don't know whether the results are accurate or not because you can't read it, right? So, so I'm gonna show you how you can actually uh, then clean up that list because that cleanup process is very essential because otherwise you'll be completely off, right? And uh, you wanna upload that, um, that export into Google Sheets. And then I'm gonna show you a Google Sheets formula that you can use to actually do the reverse translation from Japanese into English so that you can actually see what's written there. And then you go through this selection process and select your keywords. So those are the simplified steps. I'm going to just, um, you know, walk you through the exact uh, steps that I mentioned uh, by just taking an example. So let me start with, um, let's say, bath towels. So I get a bunch of results here, right? Um, I want to scroll down to find something that has a substantial number of reviews and is uh, ranked organically pretty high. So here, I mean, I am seeing something uh, that is uh, showing a lot of reviews. So 4,491 sponsored. Um, I'm looking around this 240, 65, 40,000. So this looks like it's been around for a while, is ranked pretty high organically. So let me look at this one, I think, right? I mean, you could do it with uh, this one or this one, but let me just start with the organic. Uh, and the way to do that is, uh, you know, with Helium 10, uh, the the extension, you will get this uh, extra box here, this information box that tells you what their ranking is uh, in home and kitchen. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the different uh, browse nodes. So you know that this is a pretty strong product. Um, and then you click on these uh, three dots and then just go and uh, run on Cerebro. So I'm going to click on that. And then uh, almost by magic, you will get your list of keywords. Okay, almost there. Uh, 
All right. Okay. So now I got my list of keywords right here. And, um, you know, I can read uh, these and I know that not all of them are accurate. So I need to do a cleanup process here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to export my data. Uh, I could export as a CSV file or, or as an Excel. I just did CSV. Um, and then while that's downloading, let me just show you uh, something which I have here. It's a Google Sheets formula, very handy. Um, it can be used for anyone who's blind to any, any language, right? It could be English, Japanese, any language in the world, uh, you can use this. So there's two formulas you wanna know. Uh, the first one is basically how to translate from English to Japanese. And the second one is from Japanese to English. So it's basically just Google Translate and then you point to the cell, right? Whichever cell it is. And then you type uh, EN for the source language and JA for the destination language uh, or the other way around. Right. So that's the simple formula. And you can just, you know, you can just use it in a sheet like this. So I've created a sheet here. Uh, so I was just doing some research before this. Uh, I've got my formula right in here and I can drag this down uh, and add more. Yeah. Right. So that's pretty easy. And I can just uh, keep adding English words if I just want to do some random uh, searches and I just want some seed keywords to uh, to begin my search. If I want to do a quality search in Japanese, I could also do it this way. But now that we've got our um, Cerebro download here, um, I'm going to go into my other sheet, the Cerebro input, uh, and I am going to just import. And then I will just upload and then I just drag my CSV file over here and then I just say replace current sheet. Okay, cool. So now it's just uh, imported everything, right? Now, obviously I don't know what this is. So I'm gonna add two columns here, right? Uh, I'm just gonna add, insert one column for the language translation and another column for keyword selection. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my formula over from here where I will make a little tweak to it because that was English to Japanese. Now I'm gonna do the other way around. So I will say J, A, and E, N, okay? Uh, so now it has, it's going to just, I'll just double click that and it's just translating now, right? So now this is basically for me, uh, if I don't understand the language, right? Now in the column next to it, while this is loading, I am going to insert, uh, it might slow my system down a little bit, but I'm gonna insert a checkbox, which is a very handy tool. Oops, wait, I, I guess it was a pretty long list that Helium 10 gave me, okay? Um, okay, maybe I'll just uh, reduce the the load on the system by getting rid of some columns, maybe. Okay. Um, I guess I'm just gonna do a wait. We'll we'll give that Google yeah, I mean, sheets a minute. Yeah. yeah but I, um, just to backtrack that formula. Yeah that Ritu shared, I mean, for anyone that doesn't speak Japanese, that's the money, right? That's the gold because I, you know, I've used this many times because if, if I you know, get the list of keywords from Cerebro when it spits out all the Japanese, you can just plug into the Google Sheet and then put down its formula. The next row, just drag it down and then translate awesome. everything for you. And that, mm -hmm. that, I mean, saves like hours or days of work, right? I mean, it's not going to be a hundred percent, but I mean, you at least you, you get like, it's going to be like, you know, a bath towel and not like, you know, I don't know, like like a table or something. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so, I'll actually just add that you should use it for PPC so, as well because the Amazon translation for PPC is is hideous. They they give you like entirely different or or, or just incorrect words. So putting it into sheets is actually good if you aren't a, a Japanese speaker. Right, yeah. For keywords. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, so I think the translation is uh, almost done. So I just inserted a checkbox and now I'll just double click this cell here. So I'll get checkbox all the way down. Um, and now I can actually read my, um, my words and just uh, basically this checkbox uh, acts as a toggle. So uh, if I, um, you know, if I, one sec, um, if I find something that looks like the right word for me, I'll just uh, basically just do a, a checkbox there. 
Now I'm just doing it randomly here. You guys get the idea. It's just basically a selection process where you can literally eyeball the whole list fairly quickly, just going down and press pressing the you know the right words and then you basically filter it out and you've got your list and the beauty of it is that you can basically pick up your search volume and your Japanese keyword uh, filter it on the selection and that's it you've got your list uh, ready to uh, to use it's kind of pretty cool so uh, so that's my simple uh, simple method for people who don't know Japanese um, and can get started, you know, so that's that's kind of a easy way to, to do it. Uh, just to add a bonus tip here, uh, you know, if, if even this is hard for you, you can always start an auto campaign um, and then use tools. Uh, you know, I'm just showing you one from our software, which is PPC Ninja, where you can actually um, uh, extract or harvest keywords uh, in Japanese from your auto campaigns. And again, use Google Translate to validate whether those keywords are actually correct or not because you know oftentimes your search term report gives you garbage and you want to make sure that you have a pretty clean list when you're trying to create manual campaigns out of it so just those two uh, things to uh, watch out for okay so i think um, i've covered the first uh, of my uh, seven ways of going about it but i also want to add a caveat uh, which uh, explains a little bit more of what the japanese language looks like and you know how uh, it's, it's it's a little bit different from English because they don't have any spaces. So as, as you can see here, this is a, a paragraph from a newspaper and it just goes on and on and on. There's no gaps. Uh, so if there are no gaps, uh, how do you know where the word ends, right? So um, it is just something to keep an eye out for because when you actually create your titles or whoever does your translation, they should be aware of this because all, all your major uh, keywords that you pick for SEO uh, need to be um, separated by spaces because otherwise the algorithm will treat it the way it likes, uh, which can sometimes be interesting because each of these coronavirus I see right there. There you go, coronavirus. <laughs> this is yeah, Bradley can read Japanese. So coronavirus, uh, you know, is is in a different. Uh, you know, um, script, the, the Katakana script, whereas these other guys are in kanji, which is the ch Chinese script. So let me show you um, how people actually mix and match all of these four scripts in a single sentence. And that makes it kind of hard uh, for most people to get. Uh, so these are your four scripts in Japanese. So there's hiragana, there's kanji, there's katakana, and there's English, and they use all of them together. So the next level, the, the more advanced level of keyword research will actually look at uh, some sort of hybrid approach that includes all of these. And uh, you know we'll share more details about that uh, at the in-person event uh, when we meet in Japan. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, I'm going to stop here, not hog everybody's time because there's more topics to cover. Uh, hopefully this was helpful, but uh, we can also take questions later on if you want any specifics. So back to you, Gary. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we, we had two quick uh, comments about translation. Alejandro said that DeepL Translate is an excellent translator. It's powered by AI. I've tested it against Google and it's way better. And then uh, Ahmed the chat GPT also can be good for translation. Any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah. So yes, the chat GPT version actually is part of our advanced uh, way of going about things. And uh, it can it can be used uh, in very creative ways, but it t totally depends on the prompt you choose. Uh, and, you know, like if you use the same prompt, it's got some amount of creativity built into it. So every time you ask the, the question, it's going to give you a different reply. So there's a little bit of prompt engineering that you need to do with uh, using chat GPT, but it's totally doable. In fact, we have... Uh, integrated chat GPT into Google Sheets uh, to basically to help with this kind of stuff with translation and, and things. Uh, with DeepL, I know uh, I, in fact, a lot of people have recommended DeepL, um, but again, that also has its limitations. So you will still need to go through the, um, you know, convert back uh, step uh, with Google Sheets uh, if, if you want to be absolutely sure that the translation is high quality. Excellent. Okay. And we will be covering this in further depth at the in-person event in Tokyo. Um, yes. So if you want to join us, that would be awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Ritu. And just for the interest of time, let's move to Nick. So would you okay. like to share your screen? Shall I try a share? Um, wish me luck. Can you see? Are we sharing? Yes, looks good. 
Okay. Um, so I'm just going to move this out of the way. Okay, so I mentioned earlier on, I'm not entirely sure uh, if this is going to be high level or not. Uh, I'd say I'd like to think that it's it's not difficult what I'm going to explain or go through today, but um, just from daily speaking to various sellers and brands, it seems like they are on the most part leaving out probably the most important step uh, of it, will your product sell in Japan? So the whole idea is that you have a brand, maybe you're an American seller, you sell in America, um, and you want to sell in Japan and you want to know if your product will sell or not. So I'm just going to go through the basic kind of concepts um, without actually using the tools themselves. So um, I'll probably start with the fact that, that don't make any assumptions about Japan because in most cases, you're probably going to be wrong. You'll actually be surprised how wrong you can be. Uh, how many things you can think about Japan and because you've got that from TV, from the media, and it's really not what Japan is like. So, I mean, to give a, a really brief example before I actually do start, if I was to say a product like matcha, which I know is very, very popular in uh, America, Japanese people don't drink matcha. And that would probably surprise a lot of people because matcha is like, it's the most Japanese thing you could possibly think of. And I won't detract from the fact that Starbucks is making a killing in Japan from uh, from matcha shakes, but people at home do not drink matcha. Nobody has it in their house. They drink green tea. And so if you were a matcha brand, to be honest, you would sell a hell of a lot more in America than you would in Japan, but you probably wouldn't know that unless you actually looked into it. So that's kind of don't make assumptions about Japan because the problem is, is that essentially you just don't know what you don't know. I know that's a really obvious statement to make, but unless you actually really look into something, you could be completely wrong. Um, and then coming back to the actual tools themselves, tools will, will give you the information, like Richard just showed, uh, you can get sales volumes, you can get keyword searches, so keyword information. So they'll tell you what's selling, but they don't really kind of explain why something is selling. Um, and then I suppose, uh, well, or why something isn't selling. And so also you couldn't really assess whether the market is growing or the market is shrinking, and you'll get that from a more kind of holistic approach to research. So what I'm going to do is just quickly, um, I'm sorry for the janky slides, by the way, I didn't have very long to put this together. So uh, anyway, so if you are a seller in America, for example, and you want to sell in another marketplace, for example, you're selling in the UK. So I'm just going to compare UK and Germany now for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the Amazon marketplace, it's about the same size for the UK and, Germ uh, for the UK and Japan. Um, the UK marketplace is bigger than Japan. The UK is third, Japan is fourth. Um, but there is a bit of a cu currency conversion that went on with the uh, American, uh, Amazon American results that kind of made Japan look like it was falling behind the UK, probably more than it actually is. Anyway, it's a comparable marketplace. Size-wise, it's about the same. Japan is a little bit bigger than the UK. Population-wise, the population is double the size of the UK. Uh, GDP wise, Japan is bigger than the UK. But like, if we're just going to just match UK and uh, Japan, uh, they are kind of comparable marketplaces. So the main thing I would like people to take away is that you, you kind of need to get out the mindset of if a marketplace is a similar size, you could expect to have a similar amount of sales. You couldn't be more wrong. Um, even if a marketplace is a similar size, you could have drastically uh, different results. Um, I mean, we have, we are running um, one particular brand that was launched in Japan and the UK at the same time. And Japan has significantly higher sales than the UK, um, even though the markets are a similar size. So there are some products that will sell infinitely more in the UK, there were some that will sell infinitely more in Japan even if they are of a comparable size. So that's just one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, so it, it all comes out to basically product market fit. And there are obviously big differences in Asia and Japan than there are to the UK, U Europe or America. And you really do need to kind of be aware of these. This isn't kind of next level difficult stuff, but it's something to be aware of. As I said, you just, you don't know what you don't know. So kind of try and uh, look into different things that could be different in the different marketplaces that could affect sales. So I've just, I mean, obviously I can't go through everything. There are, there's way too much to go through in total, but as of some basic ideas, things to think about, 
there are cultural differences, seasonal differences, size differences. Um, and you can apply this to almost anything that you sell. So there's difference in work-life balances, for example. Japanese people don't tend to go on holiday outside the three main holiday seasons of the year. So they'll be traveling less. Um, there are uh, school terms start at a different time. They start in April and not in August or not in September. Um, it still amazes me that Costco in Japan sends out an email every August or July sending saying, you know, start of the school year. And it's like, it's Costco Japan is sending this email out and the start of the school year is April. You, you actually be amazed how even big companies can completely miss the, completely miss the memo. Um, size, Japanese people are, actually I've got a little, got a little, uh, let's get a laser pen. Um, size, uh, people are smaller. Uh, so, I mean, you could apply it to exactly what, I didn't know what Ritu was gonna be talking about a second ago. She brought up uh, towels, she looked at towels. Uh, do you think big towels will sell in Japan? Do you think small towels will sell in Japan? This is really, really obvious. If you if you just go and look at the average size of a Japanese person, if you go and look at the average size of a Japanese bathroom, I can tell you that towels would be smaller. So if you sell lovely, big, fluffy towels in the US, you will not sell them in the in, in Japan. Um, so you can apply it to almost everything. People are smaller, homes are smaller, kitchens are smaller. There's good things and bad things about that, but it might mean that your products will sell. It might mean your products won't sell. Um, so what I'll do is actually have a quick look at brand registry, just to kind of uh, give you just a kind of example about how you could kind of go wrong with a product uh, or a product that you're selling in one marketplace that won't sell in another. So this is a slide from an old presentation I gave in, in Hong Kong a few years ago. So it's 2019. This is, this is a search from, this is the UK. And it was a search uh, in April. So the, kind of the, the season coming up. The fifth most popular search term on the whole Amazon UK was garden furniture. So for example, maybe you sell garden furniture. Now, if you were actually to do a lot of research, you could kind of have a look at Japanese houses. Um, and there are, it's got here a chart, 55% of houses, over 40% of people live in apartments. So, uh, little quiz for uh, that's Bradley's been to Japan a lot. Let's, let's pick on Brandon. Uh, Brandon, if a lot of people live in apartments, what's one thing they won't have? Yards. Yeah, exactly. So, if you don't have a garden, it's going to be difficult to sell garden furniture. Now, I want to show you a photo. Um, this is just a Google image photo. If you just Google for Japanese gardens, now. I can't kind of overstate enough that if you went to a house in Japan that had a garden like this, you would be really impressed about the size of their garden. And I know it, this could sound like I'm being sarcastic, but I am not. This would be regarded a large garden. Well, the fact that you have a garden is amazing. This will, this will be regarded a large garden. So if you kind of jump back to uh, Amazon UK, remember the fifth most ranked product was garden furniture. You, you kind of look on Amazon UK, garden furniture, the bestseller, you take that bestseller and you put it in the Japanese garden and you can kind of see the problem that you've got with, you have to look into the market in a more holistic way. So how do you know if a product is gonna sell in Japan? To be honest, the easiest way of doing it is just to Google it. Um, so, you know, a couple of days ago, in order for this presentation, I Googled, uh, do Japanese houses uh, have gardens? And the first thing that comes up is most modern Japanese homes have little space for a garden. So if you sell garden furniture, you already know what you're working with. It, this is not difficult. And then the next thing I would do is go onto YouTube and actually kind of YouTube and just look for people who are showing you around their houses or showing you around their yard, which does happen quite a lot. You can, you can find some really good information from just walkthroughs of houses and things in Japan. Um, so that's, that's gardens. Let's go on to something else. Let's do a little, um, let's go on to home and kitchen as a category. So let's do a little pop quiz here. Uh, so let's play spot the difference. I like to think of it as spot the opportunity because we are sellers here. So you should always be looking for opportunities. If you go onto Google uh, and have a look for an average American kitchen. Um, well, someone's got their mic on. Is it? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Oh, I'm assuming yeah. Okay, so 
Um, this would be like an average American kitchen. And if you do a Google search for a Japanese kitchen, you might find something like this. Everybody's been into a Japanese house that has a kitchen exactly like this. I mean, um, this is literally my grandmother's, my wife's mother's kitchen. I, I kid you not, it, it, it looks identical to this. Um, that's another kitchen that this will be a kitchen in, an, in like an average apartment in Japan, um, like an average single bedroom apartment in Tokyo, for example. This would be a really swank kitchen. This would be like a beautiful new kitchen. So if we put all these things together, you can kind of just from doing an image search, you can kind of see what things would sell and what things wouldn't sell. So if you look at the, the, I mean, okay, Brandon, I'll pick on you again. I mean, you know a lot about product research. Um, tell me some things that would, would, would this sell this knife rack? Would this sell in Japan? No, there's no way. I think anything that takes up too much uh, space on the counter is not going to work, huh? Exactly. But then you've got to flip that and anything, if you have a space saving device, um, or things where you could what hang about, things What about up a rack wall. to hang the knives? Well, exactly. I mean, you can see racks here. So this person here has got racks on here. Yes, exactly. Racks a rack racks to hang on. So this is where you should be thinking. And the idea is I can't go through every, obviously, type of category and every type of product, but just doing searches, Google searches, image searches, YouTube searches, you can, you can, you can learn a lot about whether your product will sell or not, whether you need to change your product, whether you have a smaller version of your product, whether you want to produce a, a, a version for Japan that is smaller and more compact. Um, and then kind of as an aside from what I've just been saying, there's one more thing I would like to come to, and that's ethnic groups in Japan. It is actually kind of related to what we were talking about, or what I was talking about. Um, if you look at the, the groups in Japan, um, basically Japan is full of Japanese people. Uh, Groundbreaking, ground, groundbreaking stuff. I know, but it's 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 Japan is full of Japanese people, which means that if you have a kitchen, if you sell things for a kitchen, uh, you could sell something for this kitchen, and you'd probably get a lot of the market. Or if you sell um, hair dye, uh, your clients or the Japanese audience. 100% will have black hair. I mean, it's going to be black hair, right? If you sell shoes, uh, every single man in Japan has size 26 or 27 centimeter feet. I mean, because it's a very homogeneous country, you can basically have a product and you could target all men or all women or things that you probably couldn't do in other marketplaces. So the fact that when you get a, a marketplace that is very homogeneous, if you do find a good market fit for a product you can probably sell infinitely more than you could in a much larger marketplace like the us um which is more uh diverse so that's just kind of one last thing that i was kind of wanted to mention at the end there because often people can think that the japanese market is very different and see that as a difficulty whereas you should be seeing it as an opportunity um but just be aware that it is very, very different. And as I said at the very beginning, never make assumptions. Always Google, and you'll find out uh, pretty quickly whether you're on the right path or the wrong path. Okay, I'll switch back now. Excellent. Nick, we had a... Um... Uh, interesting question in the chats. Uh, Umer asked, why don't we simply look at search volume? Um, well, you can look at search volume, but that's that's basically what I was coming down to from, from, from the very beginning. If you if the search volume is very, very high for a product and you actually know for a fact that it's selling a lot of units, that's fine. That's great. If you if you if you have accurate information for sales, then that's very good. But what I'm trying to say is that's not the only thing you want to be looking at. You really have to look at the market overall because you don't know if it, you kind of want to know the reason why. And if you kind of, if everything makes sense, uh, if a product is selling very well and you just kind of look at how people use it, look on YouTube, you look at videos, look at photos, say, oh, now that makes sense. Then you could be a lot more confident about it. But what I'm saying is that you really do need to look uh, at the market as a whole, as opposed to just, I would say, just sales 
um, on Amazon. Yes. And often right. there That's... are cases where there are products where you don't get data for as well, um, which is very common. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not saying one, one method is better than the other. What I'm saying is that you should take a, a slightly broader approach to researching the market and not assuming things is yes. the main takeaway and, that I'm hoping people get. Yes, and I, that's what I was thinking as we were planning this webinar, because on one hand, you know, we two really gave you a way to look through the numbers to a more, uh, method, you know, methodical approach with the search volume. And, you know, Nick is going the other direction without these tools, there's ways to better understand the market, spot these opportunities, et cetera. So um, moving forward, I'd like to turn the show over to Brandon now, who's going to walk you through a, a dive, uh, going through some of these. Uh, opportunity. So Brandon, would you like to share your screen? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I think our methodology is very similar to Ritu's in many way, may, ways. Um, just to give you guys an idea. Um, I think that the, the translation that you did is excellent, probably something we would still do. And then just to make sure we have relevant keywords, but I did a dive here, and if you look at what I what I looked at, I looked at diaper bags. Um, so I basically just I had to Google the diaper bag keyword, and you can look at subcategories, right? Like I don't I can't read that, but I can just look at look at a couple different subcategories, and then I can add a bunch of the best sellers to to the tray, and then I can do a dive, and within a couple minutes. I've got this master keyword list here with, I don't know how many I selected, maybe 25 or 27 competitors. And I basically took all of the best sellers of the key, of these products that were ranked well for diaper bag. I think I got some general purses in here that I would probably remove in the next dive. If I did a little bit more search, like a time, time filtering this, but what I'm able to see now, and I can't read a single word, but I see all of the most relevant keywords. So these are the keywords that are that most of these best sellers are ranked for. And um, I would probably, I think a good practice would be to go through the roots word. So we have a way where we take that whole list of keywords, because what we're seeing here is that we've got 93 keywords and 88,000 search volume uh, of what we find is relevant. But I would go through those and I would uh, I would look at the roots. These are the repeated words and phrases from that list. And so I would take this list and I would go use the same practice that Ritu did so I could make sure that I remove any brand names or not relevant keywords and uh, by simply just adding them to um, the negative. Um, so uh, I have exclusions here and I can filter out an entire phrase. So this phrase, I can't read it, but if it wasn't relevant, there's 10 words with it and 2,200 search volume, I could remove it from my data set so I don't write it in. But then once I clean up the, the data set, I would go over to my listing builder and I would just let, I would let Datadive write the listing, the title for me at the very least. So I did this. And as you can see, I've got a very high ranking juice. I put most of these keywords in some kind of, uh, it says broad match in the title. And then I've, I've represented every one of those repeated words and phrases, again, which we call roots. So I've repeated most of these in the title here. And then I've got my title here. So without speaking the language, I've got a very rough title that is optimized based on the data. And I would probably hire someone that speaks the native language to clean this up again but make sure that the words I'm using are relevant. And I would have a very relevant, uh, like a highly rated uh, title that would give me a very high opportunity to rank in Japan, just from going through the same motions we go through with data dive in any marketplace. So I don't know if, uh, I've never done this Excellent. for Japan. It was very interesting. This was a really fun exercise. I might yeah. have a bunch of things in here, but it is interesting that I noticed that there is English in here, right? Like baby bag and diaper bag. And uh, like you said, it's a real mix of those four different phrase, like types of languages, uh, which is really cool too. That's actually a best practice uh, to include uh, English words as well in the title. So I think it did a good job. Awesome. 
And then in the bullets, it included some words like the AI bullets. We're going to have the AI write the bullets in the voice of the shopper. So basically when we prompt our AI, this is still in beta internally, but we're going to have the AI write the bullet for the features and benefits with these keywords included. So the first step is we optimize for ranking potential by including the keywords that need to be in each bullet. And then the AI will go in and write the bullets talking about the features and benefits to the buyer, the typical buyer of a diaper bag and, um, and, and, and maximize the ranking potential uh, while still doing a good job of speaking to the buyer about why they should buy your product. So this, this button will be clickable for all others in the next few weeks. Excellent. I think that's awesome that, you know, you can at least process this without knowing the language. I mean, you have some numbers that you can start with and then we can yeah. utilize the tools. Yeah. From a product can... research perspective, I would probably, again, look, this is interesting because you have Google traffic and trends. It looks which is interesting when I, I'm just looking at this right now, but it popped into my head that Japan has a declining population. They have an issue with not having enough babies. And you can see that the trend over the last five years is less searches for baby bags for diaper bags. Hmm. So um, it, it's right on, right on trend. And you can, you can also go in and see how many variations each, each one has. You can see the trends of the sales. Um, you can see their content. And if I just wanted to only look at the content instead of going through all of them, I could collapse all and then just get an idea of how good the brands are. Now, when I think of sophistication and how good a brand is, I'm thinking, you know, one with features and benefits as the second image, lifestyle, like, like this is a good listing, right? Um, there's a warranty here. There's uh, there's proof. There's They're telling a real story through these images, but this is terrible. Like number, the best, second best seller and the fourth best seller are just images of the product. So it shows me that this market is disruptable from a content perspective, but I don't know if these are major brands. Typically, this is what I'll see in America is if a bestseller has a bad listing, but they're still a bestseller, it's because they're a very widely known brand and they're just relying on their name brand. So that could be the case here. But uh, for the most part, I like being able to dissect a, a, an opportunity across keywords, across uh, the sophistication of the content and how good the sellers are. So if, again, if I go back to the master keyword list, can I, there's, um, let's see, I've got percentage, let me, percentage of search volume here, 56. So I haven't cleaned up this list, but this, this seller is only on 56% of the search volume from this list and they're the best seller. And this guy is doing really well and they're on the 39%. So there's a lot of sellers here that are not ranked for most of these keywords, but I don't know what these keywords are and I haven't cleaned up the list. So maybe once I take out irrelevant keywords, the list will get much more competitive or the market will get much more competitive. But this gives us a really big head start once we go in and then we can copy, we can actually export the keywords and then and then, and then then do that same formula that, that Ritu did, which would be great. So we have an export button here. So... This is uh, this was fun. This was like a cool way to get a roundabout way to do like kind of what Ritu did. Yeah, excellent. So thanks so much, Brandon. We yeah. covered three different ways that you guys can do product research for Amazon Japan without knowing the language. And um, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, guys. I mean, I think this will help a lot of you guys get started and you know, learn more about product market fit. But at the same time, I wanted to introduce an opportunity for um, certain sellers, if you're already selling in the U.S., if you're already saying and you really want to sell in Japan, I wanted to introduce the seven-figure seller Japan Mastermind that we're going to have here in Tokyo in April. So this is going to be a two-day in-person event, April 4th to the 5th, and everybody that was speaking today is going to be there. So Ritu Java is going to be there. She's going to be talking about all of these additional keyword strategies that we didn't have time to cover today. Nick is going to be here like in the flesh. So if you have any questions about you know, what he's doing and he's even doing stuff like, you know, cool stuff, external traffic and external marketing wise. I mean, there's a native app, a social media app here in Japan that, um, you know, he's building audiences, he's retargeting, he's getting more reviews. So you can ask him more about that. And then Bradley's going to be here. And Brent is going to be here as well. I think it's going to be an awesome event. 
and then um, Amazon's coming as well. So I wanted to let you guys know about this opportunity. And if you do want to check it out, we'll share the link down below in the chat. Um, so this will be the main goal is to help existing Amazon sellers sell additional 300K up to you know $960,000 in Amazon Japan. We've had case studies of sellers who've done that. Um, I, I'm curious, um, Bradley and you know Brandon, you know you guys are coming to to learn as well, right? Um, why should people why should people come to this event? I'm curious, um, Bradley, what do you what do you think first? Well, you know it's it's kind of like uh, you know Nick kept saying you don't know what you don't know, right? And so this is the way you educate yourself, and this is, I would say, of the main marketplaces, Japan is one of the most unique. And one of the most kind of difficult that people think about it's when, when you actually get to doing it, it's not as, as difficult, but uh, Amazon marketplaces around like, you know, you have a strategy in Amazon USA, a lot of that same exact strategy you can go ahead and use in Amazon Spain or Amazon UK or something like that. But then Japan, you know, like with words, you know, that, that don't have spaces and four different alphabets and, and Hey, what, what, you know, you and I were talking on the the podcast, um, or maybe it was Nick who had said it a few weeks ago. How in Japan, if you're going to sell anything that touches food, it has to have a certain kind of certification. And so there's tons of things that people, including myself, because I've never sold uh, in Japan yet, um, do not know. And and that that's actually a good thing because the heart, the the bigger the barrier of entry, the more steps that people have to jump through to do something. That means the less people who are actually doing it, less competition. So this is a great opportunity to kind of like learn all, all these things that nobody else in the world uh, is, is taking advantage of right now and nobody else knows about. You're going to be able to learn these things in person and, and probably right after this event, you're going to be pumped up and ready to go ahead and 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 potentially launch your product if it's relevant to the Japanese marketplace. Sure, 100%. Brandon, what do you think? What, yeah, I 100% agree with today? Bradley. Yeah. I, I'm excited about the opportunity to expand. Like I said, I think uh, our supply chain is right there. We've got hundreds of SKUs. We have to do a lot of research to figure out what Japanese parents are buying their kids with our toy brand. Uh, it's not going to be the same, right? Like the cultures are very different. What they, you know, I imagine some of our educational toys might relate, but they might not. Um, but they're definitely, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm excited. I think. Um, I, I don't know about the regulations. I don't know, but I'm there to learn. I'm there to, to expand my business as well. I think if we can plug in Japan at some point this year, uh, it will be a big win for us. Uh, it's definitely a marketplace that is lowest hanging fruit. Uh, with margin compression, with the cost of uh, goods going up, with PPC going up in America, we got to look for opportunities to turn our money over faster, to raise our, our bottom line at the end of the year. And uh you could do that by sourcing goods in Mexico and trucking it across the border to get a faster turn if you're going to continue to sell in, in dot com. But I think Japan represents a place where it's not much disruption to your supply chain and it's low hanging fruit. I think I think that's a great op, uh, opportunity as well. Excellent. And I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, when it comes to learning about like the market, you know, besides coming to our conference, you know, so, you know, if you're not sure about the regulations, we'll have an importer of record, right? Just to walk you through everything you need to know to import your product into Japan. If you're not sure about the compliance testing, we'll have, you know, someone that's a compliance testing expert. They've done hundreds of products importing into Japan. So they can tell you exactly what sort of test or certification you need, right? Um, you know, VAT, um, you know, there's no VAT in Japan, et cetera, right? Um, but at the same, same time, you know, Brandon and uh, Nick and I, you know, with the, the previous, live webinar we did, I mean, another opportunity is to physically be in the market, like setting foot, you know, going to a toy store in person, right? Getting hands on with the toys, touching and feeling, you know, observing what people are, are buying here in Japan and, you know, checking out the pricing, et cetera. I think that's super valuable. I mean, just being able to, you know, get hands on in a new marketplace, you know, that's uh, another opportunity to not only better understand the market from the market research perspective, but possibly get new product ideas. I mean, there's like a lot of quirky stuff you see in Japan you don't really see in the US, right? Maybe you can spot like a new opportunity that you can bring to you know, your home market. So, you know, there's all these different opportunities that um, that we're seeing. So, um, yeah, excellent. 
I, I, I see some questions in the chat. Let's let's get mm. to some of these questions in the chat. Um, I was just looking at some of those. Yeah. So we had some. Questions. Um. Somebody was asking about Japan. Does it have VAT or GST? It has neither. It has consumption tax, uh, and it's ten percent or eight percent if it's food and drink. By the way. Um. What about customs clearance and taxes? Um. Well, that's pretty much the whole. That's pretty much the whole point of uh, Gary's conference, <laughs> so that you you when, when you go, you could actually speak to the importers, you could speak to the the people that know about all of this. Um, it's it's not something you can really, I don't think. Uh, yeah, tax implications. I don't really want to talk about that here, but that's kind of the idea of speaking to the service providers directly at the at at the conference, so you can get all these questions answered from an expert as opposed to um, possibly getting some incorrect information from people like me. So, I mean, all of the experts will be in, in the room at the same time. So if you have any questions about compliance, that thing, that, you know, V2 is going to be there, you know, you, you want to get some more help. And I, I mean, V2, I believe you mentioned you're willing to do an over their shoulder look like a PPC live audit on, on their listing. Is that right, V2? Yes. Any, any of those two days, anytime, just grab me and I'll do a, PPC audit in Japanese for you guys. Yeah. So, I mean, that could be priceless. I mean, Ritu helped me with my Amazon Japan listing as well. I mean, just like trying to, you know, decrypt all of the, the Japanese. And, you know, I think that could be huge for, for a lot of people. Um, so we have, okay, we have a couple more questions in comments. I've, I've, I've noticed a few about if you need a Japanese entity, you don't. You don't yeah. need to have a Japanese business entity. You don't need to be registered or have an office in Japan. Um, yeah, actually, I was speaking to my account manager, one of the brands, uh, last week, and she said that from there's a there is a point at some point next year where they're going to ask uh, sellers to register their consumption tax number if they do have a consumption tax number, um, on Amazon. So it's the first time that Amazon is actually, is actually going to require people to register a tax number if you are required to have one for Japan that's coming in next year. Right. Um, I see Alejandro had a comment. Mexico has a free trade agreement with Japan. That's a great opportunity. I didn't realize that. I mean, if that's true, yeah. then, you know, that's even more reason you're sourcing from Mexico. Right. Yeah, I've, I've actually heard um, about a few. There are, there are, there are, there are a few countries that have those. I haven't, uh, yeah. haven't looked into them myself, but that's definitely a great opportunity. And, if you guys are currently sourcing from China, importing into the US, obviously there's the, you know, the trade war, et cetera, you know, with the 25% plus the additional duties from China to the US. The beauty about selling in Japan is there's no trade war, there's no additional tariff. So um, you can circumvent that selling into Japan. So that means lower product, only landed costs for you guys. So let me see. Um, well, yeah, I see a question about Rakuten and Amazon and I asked Nick, Nick last time about this. You have a you have a very uh, great insight about the 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 difference there. Um, yeah, so Rakuten and Amazon are about the same. They have about the same market share, uh, although Amazon appears to be kind of pulling ahead of Rakuten. But they're both around about the twenty percent mark, um, and they you can sell on both. We sell most of our brands on both the platforms. Uh, it's kind of good to be on both. But I would definitely start on Amazon. Amazon obviously has FBA. Rakuten does have uh, something called RSL. It's their own version. It's not as good. Um, but customers, uh, a lot of customers will only buy on Rakuten. Some customers will only buy on Amazon. Uh, some customers will do both. Rakuten has a very good point system. Uh, they've had a point system for many years. They've got, so in Japan, it's a Rakuten infrastructure as, for example, WeChat would be an infrastructure in uh, China. So people have Rakuten credit cards. Um, they have Rakuten bank accounts. They have, you know, there's there's a whole slew of services that Rakuten provides, and each of them give you points that can be redeemed on the Rakuten platform. So uh, very often, when we kind of look through our sales, uh, we could be selling a product that's, you know, or a customer could have bought a hundred dollars worth of products, and we can see that they paid zero for it because they just used their points. So. That's something that Amazon is trying to address. Amazon has brought out points. Um, only Amazon Japan is the only marketplace in the world that actually has a kind of a points program, um, but they're not doing very well. 
just because they're not being able to compete on the points front. So it's a very different type of customer on both of them. And you tend to find different types of products as well. Um, so especially in the clothing category or uh, things like food and drink tends to, uh, Rack 10 tends to be a more popular platform. When it comes to electronics, it's Amazon, but there is a shift towards Amazon overall. But um, yeah, that's pretty kind of, that's when you start to get to the higher level stuff. But yeah, there are Amazon products and there are Rakuten products, but as, as there are online products and retail products in every other country. Um, yeah, just uh, I can add a little bit about the Rakuten versus Amazon. So Rakuten is, uh, you know, Jap Japan's homegrown uh, portal, right? It's their own kind of native portal and it's been around since um, 1997. So it's been around for a while and Amazon just caught up recently during the pandemic. And that's when things started to change a little bit and people started to look to Amazon because of their fast shipping and, you know, how they're like just a global uh, power. Um, but uh, what I've uh, understood and heard is that Rux then um, tends to attract the older population a little bit more. So the demographic is kind of skewed towards the older uh, you know, eight elderly people would go to Rakuten, not to Amazon. And Amazon is mostly seen as a place to buy cheap stuff, uh, you know, and stuff that they will easily get even at a dollar store or uh, anything below $50. 50, um, uh, $50. Uh, Amazon seems to be like a, a good place that people turn to for that sort of stuff. But whenever it crosses the threshold of $50, it becomes an issue of like, do I trust this brand? Uh, and then they rely on their kind of uh, peer group because there's a lot of um, uh, viral marketing that's possible in Japan. If one person buys something or endorses something, then everybody wants that. Right? Everybody begins to trust that. So the trust barrier is kind of the kind of differentiating uh, factor between the Amazon versus the Rakuten type of products. But recently it's become, you know, more and more that whatever you find on Amazon, you also find on Rakuten and vice versa, as, as Nick was saying. All right, excellent. Um, Actually, one other, one, other, one other quick thing I'll mention yeah. about Rakuten yeah. is that Rakuten and Amazon have, have different sales seasons, right? So Amazon has Prime Day, and uh, obviously Black Friday. So Rakuten in Japan uh, today, the 10th, it's the last day for the last week we've had Rakuten Super Sale. It runs Super Sale. Yeah, it's, it's run four times a year. Um, and so we just finished up this the last week. So you kind of get these really nice sales boosts that are outside. They obviously at Rakuten do not do things the same time as Amazon does it. So those big sale, you get a lot more big sale periods if you do sell on both platforms that's just one other thing that i'll add but that's probably something after a year of being on amazon that's probably when you want to look to to to, to go on Rakuten as well excellent all right guys um we're a little over time i want to be respectful of everyone's time so if you do have to run nick ritu bradley and brandon i just want to thank you again for coming on um and also what is the best way to to connect with you if people want to learn more so let's start with ritu um, yeah, so we're PPC Ninja, so you can look us up, ppcninja.com, and uh, we provide uh, kind of full service management in Japan. Uh, we're also a software and a managed services company. Uh, you can reach me, um, Ritu, at ppcninja.com. Okay, perfect. And Nick, best way to connect? Um, you could just send it to my personal email. It's my name backwards. So cats, Nick, K A T Z N I C K at gmail.com. Um, if you're interested in entering the Japanese marketplace, you can, you can contact me there. And you work mainly with larger businesses, right? Nick? Yeah. 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 We kind of, we're like, kind of, kind of like a, a, like a full stack kind of thing. We do, we take over the entire account essentially. Um, okay. but yeah. But definitely, if you're interested, contact me and I could always put you in contact with other people that may be able to help you better. Perfect. And Brandwin, best way to connect and learn more? Uh, you can reach me. Uh, I have a Facebook group, uh, Seller Systems, um, sellersystems.com. Uh, we finally got rid of the dash. I was able to buy the full domain without the dash. That's a really big win and very happy about it. Uh, <laughs> and. I don't know if my email is updated though. So it might still be brandon.young at seller systems.com. 
Uh, you can send an email. There's a free masterclass on my website at sellersystems.com. And Gary has a great discount for data dive if you guys are interested. Um, and I just actually messaged while doing this exercise, I messaged my team to add a translate button into data dive. So you can hit a button and translate it from whatever language you want to whatever language you want. So you can check the relevancy in data dive. I'm going to make sure they add that soon. Amazing. World's world premiere tonight. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, Larnie, if you can drop the link, the discount that we have for data dive, if you can, that would be awesome. All right. And Brad, the best way to connect with you and Helium 10. Uh, my Instagram serious sellers podcast um, is the best way to reach me, or you guys can just, you know, reach out, uh, just going to helium 10. And I dropped the link in the chat for, um, you know, if you guys still want to learn more about Japan and learn more about that event, we went a little bit deeper when, when we had Gary and Nick on the podcast. So I, I put the link to that, yeah. that episode Perfect. there. If anybody wants to dive a little bit deeper, definitely into, subscribe uh, to that podcast. Yeah. It's one of the best. Yes. One of our, favorites. he says that cause he's been on there five times already. So <laughs> <laughs> he's one of the hall of fame. All the episodes besides mine are the best ones. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thanks to everybody for coming on. And again, I hope that you guys can make it to Japan. Um, our seven figure seller Japan mastermind will be from April 4th to the 5th. And then it will be live in Tokyo. And then also it's like, it's basically the best time of year to visit because it's cherry blossom season in Japan. So all of the, the trees are going to be in blossom. And we're also going to do a fun um, cherry blossom night out in a Tokyo park. There'll be networking. There'll be some Jap Japanese sake, uh, beers, and sushi. It's a good time. You'll be able to uh, rub some elbows with your fellow Amazon sellers to be able to, you know, spend some more time getting to know Ritu, Nick, Bradley, Brandon. I'm so excited. I like you're making others. me so excited. We can't wait to, to see you here, Brandon. And hopefully everyone else is going to come as well. And then uh, Amazon is coming as well. We were able to get Jeff Cohen from Amazon. Um, he's on the Amazon ad side. He's their chief evangelist. So he's going to be dropping knowledge bombs on the Amazon ads internally. Jeff is such an awesome guy. To... He's, been, he's been a friend for a long time. He's, he's a great contact to have. Definitely want to go to the event to meet him as well. For sure. We're just super, super privileged to be able to have such great people come. So we hope that you guys can join us um, in Tokyo. All right. So um, thanks so much, everybody. And we will we'll see you guys hopefully in Tokyo and we'll see you at the next session. Bye everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks.